Johanna printed this off this morning. It's a letter from the Duartes from uh, November 21st. Um, so there are missionaries, um, yes, in Brazil, but they're doing, they're working on um, like an airplane ministry going into the bush as well. So, dear prayer partners, since uh, surrendering to be a missionary, my prayer has always been, Lord, I will walk through any door you open. I would have never dreamed how soon God would open the door to an unreached tribe. An Indian chief whom I befriended messaged me last month. Now oh, messaged me, so they must have some type of uh, messaging service. Asking when I was coming to visit his village. His tribe lives roughly 200 miles away and is only accessible by a three-day boat journey or by plane. Rainy season has begun, making the boat route treacherous. With the help of another mission organization in Brazil, on the morning of November 5th, we took off to visit this tribe. We flew mostly over dense, uninhabited jungle. When I arrived, most of the village was outside waiting to greet us. I was invited into their main meeting house and was able to begin teaching the Bible. They served us a wonderful fish meal they caught in the early, in the nearly, caught in the nearly river must be the name of the river. My family and I have prepared treat bags for the kids with candy, Bibles, and a toy and tracks. I also gave an ax to the chief. This tribe was very welcoming, and Lord willing, we'll soon receive a formal invitation to return on a regular basis. You've been praying for an open door to reach these Indians, and God has answered your prayers. May Jesus Christ be praised for the souls he will save from this tribe. When busy preparing to start regular preaching services as a means to further reach the loss of the gospel, pray with us in this endeavor. As we preach Thanksgiving, we are thankful for each of you, our supporting pastors and church families. Thank you for partnership with us by investing your prayers and missions giving to help further the gospel in Brazil. Your missionaries in Brazil, Jed, Gloria, and Alina Duarte. I know that um, they have a plane down there, and I think... It might be inspected. I know he's working on his license to fly. It was fortunate they were able to have this other mission agency uh, to fly them in. But they're a tribe of people 200 miles away willing to have the gospel preached and taught to them. You know, I know if I walked out the doors of the church here and went down door to door, most of the people in this neighborhood would not be willing to have the gospel preached to them. Not that we shouldn't go door to door and preach the gospel anyhow, but it's just the willingness there. And I think prayer has a lot to do with it. Prayer is going ahead of time. Um, God working people's hearts, the spirit moving. I'm just thankful the Duartes are there with this ministry. Well, let's just remember them in prayer this morning. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, just thank you for, for Jed and his family as they are working in Brazil, uh, out in the bush, bush, Lord, and wherever you would have them. Just thank you for the opportunity that was offered to them to go and fly into this um, backwoods tribe, Lord, of, of people out in the middle of nowhere, but they want to hear your word, Lord, and hear the gospel be preached. Just pray for much fruit for the ministry there. May they be invited back to uh, have more preaching and teaching. And just pray for many souls to be saved, and out of that group, may there be missionaries and preachers and teachers to go out yet even farther out into the bush to teach and preach your gospel more. I just thank you for um, all their needs that you've met, Lord, just pray that you keep them healthy. Just help them to have the funds that they need to keep the mission work going there. Lord, just pray that they'd have a, uh, a good appearance, Lord, on social media. Uh, it's such a difficult place today that uh, missionaries can get dragged into and have their testimony ruined uh, by other people. And just uh, pray that you would keep, keep them safe in that regard. Lord, just uh, uh, thank you for today, Lord, a day we can come and worship you, even though our, our numbers are few, Lord. And yet, Lord, we... Um, take this day to honor you, take time to pray for others, and we just are, are thankful each that is here. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, it's been a few weeks since I was able to preach to you, so I've got a few pages of notes this morning. I won't try to pack a couple weeks into one message here this morning. I'm grateful last week I, I put a message up on um, uh, the website and quite a few of you, a number of you contacted me and thanked me for the message and I just tried to seek the Lord and what it would have me to do and, and uh, for those of you that uh, 
were encouraged by it. It encouraged me that I sought the Lord what to do and I felt like I, I did what He uh, would give me for that, for that day and, and you responded and I'm grateful. And so this morning, I, same thing. I was thinking, you know, last week we were going to have our Thanksgiving meal and, and uh, we were going to have a time of testimony, of thankfulness. And, and I sort of felt like all that got taken away from us. And, and I thought, well, no, it, it, we, we still be thankful. And uh, I'm not going to let my thankfulness be taken away from me. And so um, I want to preach you a message this morning. And again, this is going to be some, some of the things I'll say this morning will, will be some things that I've given you before. But I want to speak to you this morning on this subject. The hardest command to keep in the Bible. The hardest command to keep in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 5, look down at verse 17, if you would. And the Bible says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. God wants us to understand what the will of the Lord is. And then in the next several verses, he's going to give us some things that I believe are the will of the Lord. Let's look at it. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then in verse 18, he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so, folks, God's... Part of God's will for you, and to, for you and me is to be filled with the Spirit of God. And folks, to understand the rest of what he's going to say after this, we're going to need to be filled with his Spirit. And if we're less than that, we're not going to understand it. We're going to be, uh, we'll be discouraged at it. Uh, but if, but if, if we'll be con filled with the Spirit and say, well, preacher, how do you be filled with the Spirit? Uh, don't don't get bogged down with that that terminology in the Bible. It just means to let God control your life. To be con filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit. To let the Spirit of God control your life. And so he says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That is a command. Let God control your life. Let God control your thoughts. Uh, that's the will of God. Um, then he says in verse 19, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I don't know um, how many of you, uh, when uh, Dr. Cottle was here, uh, were able to get his... Uh, CDs, his music CDs. I'm tell you what, folks. The last uh, week or so, I've been living on his CDs. Now, I've just been singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord, and uh, I'm so grateful. Dr. Cottle was here and left us uh, those CDs. Uh, they, they have been a balm to my heart the last couple of weeks, and uh, uh, but but that is a command. It, don't to be filled with the Spirit, then it's a command to us to speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. I'm tell you what, folks, it will uplift you. Good godly music, good godly singing, uh, and, and sing with it. I'll tell you, I, 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 I'm, I can't sing. <clears throat> and when I try, my voice gets all raspy these days. I think it's my old age is, is catching up with me. But you let me get in the vehicle or something by myself, and I just sing away. And, and it helps me. It really does. Then look at verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's where I take the, the title of my message this morning. The hardest command, at least in my opinion, in the Bible to keep 
is in verse 20. And it says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. John said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, I don't know, folks. Uh, you, you think about it. Uh, giving thanks to God always for all things. Uh, maybe you think of a harder commandment, at least in your life, to give. But in my life, that I don't know, folks. That may be the hardest commandment I find to keep. Uh, at the same time, I believe if we'll learn to do that, if we'll let the Spirit of God control our life, if we'll be filled with the Spirit of God, He'll give us the power to do it. And in doing that, and in giving praise and thanksgiving to God for all things, uh, the, it'll come with great blessings in our life. I've said before there are four levels of life when it comes to thanksgiving. There are those who constantly complain. They're saved people, but just don't seem to be any thanksgiving in their heart. They constantly complain. Now, uh, listen, folks, I think if we're honest, we all complain once in a while. Is there anybody in here this morning that you never, ever complain? Anybody? Rita, you never complain about anything? Ken? I'm not talking about trying now. Maybe all the rest of us. Rita's the only one. <laughs> but they, they just can't find good in anything. Constantly complain. Then there are those who just have simple ingratitude. They don't complain all the time. They just, uh, they, they just find it hard to be grateful all the time. There are those who are grateful for the obvious blessings in life, such as health. Anybody not thankful for your health? Oh, listen, get sick and you'll be thankful for your health. You won't take it for granted. We're grateful for things like food and, and, and just, just, just the obvious blessings of life. But then the highest level of giving thanks always for all things. That's the highest level. And folks, I think that's the level that's most difficult to reach. We give thanks always for all things. I read this some time ago and I wrote it down. And if you take notes, you might want to write this down. I've said it before. Maybe you already have it. But it says this, and I don't know who said it, but it said, Seeds of discouragement will sprout almost anywhere except in the heart of a thankful person. Now meditate on that a little bit and, and see if that's true. Seeds of discouragement will sprout almost anywhere except in the heart of of a thankful person. Listen, folks, you take somebody that's thankful always for all things, it's hard to be discouraged. And so I want to give you a couple of things about this hardest commandment to obey. I want to look at the duration of thanksgiving. The duration of thanksgiving in verse 20. The Bible says, giving thanks always for all things. Giving thanks always for all. That's the duration of it. Uh, you know, folks, the blessings in our life never cease. Uh, it may be hard for us to realize them sometimes, but the blessings never cease. Therefore, our thanksgiving should never cease. We are to praise God always. We are to give thanks to God always. In Psalms 68 in verse 19, the Bible says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Folks, you take your most discouraging moments in life, you, your most... Uh, times when you're down the most 
If you'll stop, you'll find things to praise the Lord about. The Bible says He daily loads us with those benefits. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 23, the Bible says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now, I tell you what, folks, there's some times in my life that I've not felt that. But if I believe the Bible and I go back and read its pages, I got to believe that that's true. His mercies fail not. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. <clears throat> the duration of our praise, his, it, 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 ought not, it ought not cease, folks. He's good to us. He's good. And how often is, is he good? Well, he's good all the time. It's never, you see, folks, God be, his goodness is not just something he does. It's something that he is. God is good. His character uh, will not let him be anything less than good. Uh, in Philippians 4, 16, the Bible says that our prayers ought to be mixed. Uh, folks, when we go to the Lord in prayer, and I hope that you do, but when we go, how often we, do we go to God? With, we, we start out, Lord, we, we need this, we need that, so-and-so sick, so-and-so needs this, so-and-so needs that. But how often do we think about in our prayers praising the Lord and thanking Him in our prayers? In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious, if you will. But in everything by prayer and supplication, our prayer and supplication is, is pouring out our hearts to the Lord for our needs. By prayer and supplications with Thanksgiving. Let your request be made on unto the un, unto God. And so, even our prayers ought to be filled with thanksgiving. I, it, folks, I believe that's essential in having our prayers answered. Uh, so many times in our prayers, we, get, we, we leave out the thanksgiving part. Uh, and I'm guilty of that. But folks, I try to remember when I go to the Lord, Lord, be thankful. Start out with thanksgiving and then go into your prayers, your supplications. Uh, pouring out your heart for other people and for your needs. Uh, I, I, I think it, uh, we'd be wicked We'd be foolish to ask God for more blessings in our life when we've not given Him thanks for the blessings He's already given us. It'd be sort of like our kids always coming to you. Uh, Mama, Daddy, I want this, I want that. Do this for me, do that for me. And they never say thank you for what you've already done. Now, you know, I don't... Uh, I try not to get to a place where I'm looking for thanks. But it's good to know somebody's thankful for what you do sometimes. Don't, wouldn't you agree with me? And I think that's God, our God. Listen, when you come, just, just come with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what I've already done for you. And then let your prayers be known. I think we need to take, we need to take some of the groans, some of the moans out of our prayers and mix in a few hallelujahs every now and then. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me today. You've been good to us, folks. We could name some of those blessings, but let's move on. Um, look at the, the, the dimension of thanksgiving, if you will, in verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things. Mm. All things. You know, folks, God rules all things, and we should give thanks for all things. 
you, you sort of see where I'm coming from, the most difficult command to obey? Give thanks. Well, that's not hard to do. We have Thanksgiving around here all the time. Every Wednesday night or every, uh, every Sunday evening, uh, we come together. I give you opportunity. Hey, has anybody got anything you want to praise the Lord about? And we'll get it. We'll praise the Lord for this. And we'll praise the Lord for that. And we'll praise the Lord for something else. I don't hear too many. Lord, thank you that you, you gave me cancer. Well, hear me praise for that. But thankfulness ought to come before our praise. I believe we're to have a song in our heart no matter what happens to us. I think we ought to thank God for the rudimentary things in life, the very simple things in life. I think we ought to be thankful for water. I, I like water. I like water a lot. And folks, you imagine what we'd be if we didn't have water to drink. We'd be in bad shape, folks. We gotta have water. You take water away, you'll die. But how many times do we think about it? You just go to the spigot, you turn it on, and there it comes. Now, I don't drink too much water comes out of my spigot <laughs> uh, unless I uh, distill it or, 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 or but it, anyway, I'm, I'm grateful for clean water. I read a statistic one time said 75 to 80 percent of the people in India don't have pure drinking water. Can you imagine that? 75 to 80 percent of the people in India, folks, there's a lot of people live in India. Isn't it like the second most populated country in the world? India, I think. China, number one, India. I, thought, I may be wrong about that, but I think that's right. Um, I'll tell you what, folks, these last three weeks, I've washed more dirty dishes than I think I have in all of my life. I'm glad we have a dishwasher. But you know what? I was grateful. I, I was sitting there loading that dishwasher, and I'm thinking, man, I'm sure glad I got this dishwasher. I'm sure glad for these dirty dishes. That means I didn't go hungry the last three weeks when my wife was sick. And uh, you folks kept bringing food, and, and mine, I just, I had my, some of the best soup. My goodness, I had three or four different kinds of soup, and I like soup. I think I went through a bottle of Tabasco sauce. I love to hot up my soup. And, uh, but, but I, Lord, thank you for dirty dishes. Means I didn't go hungry. Uh, I think we ought to be uh, thankful for the obvious things uh, in our life, uh, the simple things. But you know, folks, uh, also, I think that we ought to be thankful. And here's the hard part of the command. I think we ought to be thankful during the sorrowful times in our life as well. You know, when Paul wrote this passage of Scripture right here by the divine inspiration of God, he was in prison. He'd been unjustly accused of starting a riot. Paul spent a lot of the time in prison. A lot of his letters come to us from prison. And a lot of it's filled with giving praise. Uh, you know, folks, we can be thankful even in sorrowful times in our life because of the overruling hand of God, because of the providence of God. He can even take sorrowful times in our life and turn it in to joy, turn it into good in our life. Now, it don't happen overnight all the time. A lot of times we have to wait on him. But he'll use sorrowful times in our life to bring praise. He may correct us. Uh, he'll use suffering and pain to correct us in our life. In Hebrews 12 and verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I like Psalms 119 in verse 67. Just a very short verse, but says this, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, 
But now have I kept thy word. See, I was out there going astray. I was away from the Lord. He brought affliction in my life, and now I've kept his word. He's brought me back. I think about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, and verses 7 through 10. Uh, listen, uh, sorrowful times in our life can cause us to have a greater dependency upon God. Paul wrote that in his thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet him, that God's grace was sufficient. One of the deepest trials in his life, he looked at it, he said, three times I sought God. And I think this is three extended periods of time that Paul was seeking God. God, would you take the thorn away? God said, Paul, I'm not going to take the thorn away, but I'm going to give you my grace. Paul said, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ might rest upon me. God's grace was sufficient when he depended on God. It'll confirm our testimony to other people. You know, folks, I think when we praise the Lord, it shames the devil. I, don't, I, think, I think the devil hates it when we praise the Lord. But it brings glory to God. Uh, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul wrote this, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul said, look it, when I go through difficult times in my life, I use it that the gospel might go forward. And I think the devil wanted to kill him. And he tried and every time he tried, the gospel went forward. In verse 29, he says, For unto you is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Paul understood sufferings. He, he understood that when, when he suffered, the gospel went forth. People got saved. And I, 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 I think about... Uh, when I went through leukemia, and, and God taught me through so much, and to this day, he's still teaching me things. But I look at the people. My daddy got saved. My daughter got saved. I've preached funerals, and people have gotten saved. Family members have gotten saved. Not the people I preached the funeral for, you understand, but family members of those folks got saved. And... Uh, and, and, and I've, I've preached the, the message that God gave me through that whole ordeal. I've had missionaries from other countries contact me, say, Preacher, I, I watched your video, and God, it, it was a difficult time in my life, and God has encouraged me to that. And we're going on because of that testimony. Uh, folks, I, you, do I want to go through that again? Absolutely not. But glory to God, He used it. He used it. For the furtherance of the gospel. And Paul wrote this uh, passage. He'd already suffered greatly. He'd been through shipwrecks and beatings and mockings and persecutions and hunger, thirst. He'd been through character assassinations. How many of you ever had your character assassinated? That's when somebody speaks evil about you. And it isn't true. Well, I, I think that that's some of the most hurtful things. Uh, if it's true, it's one thing. But when it's not true, uh, that sort of hurts. Why would he say that about me? Paul been through all of that. But all these things that have happened unto me have fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. Paul just used suffering in his life as a platform. He used it as a pulpit to preach the gospel. It'll bring a deeper maturity and more Christ-likeness. And folks, you think about it, that's God's goal in our, in, for our life anyway, is to be like Christ. When we shall see Him, we shall, uh, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. It's His goal for us. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Psalms 119 and verse 71. 
Uh, listen, uh, uh, folks, uh, God's priority for us is not wealth and health and prosperity. You listen to the TV preachers, and a lot of them, that you think if you're not rich and healthy and prosperous, you're out of the will of God. You hear a preacher say that on TV, turn him off. And I'll do my best never to have one stand behind this pulpit and say some garbage like that. Because it's not true. It's not God's primary will for our life. Now, if God so wills it in your life that you, you have good health and you're prosperous, praise the Lord. Even use that to praise Him with. But sure don't go say it's God's will for everybody. He wants to use us to spiritually mature us and make us more like Jesus Christ. James 1 and verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, and wanting nothing. The word perfect in the Scripture doesn't mean sinlessness. As a guy stood in the foyer back there one Wednesday night after I preached, and told me he, he had reached perfection. He was sinless in his life. <laughs> I talked to him for a little bit. He started getting mad at me. I kept giving him scripture and, and I didn't, and wouldn't go a long way. He started getting angry. I said, you're getting angry at me, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. There goes your sinlessness. Stand right back there in that foyer. The word patience means endurance. And bearing up under suffering and problems. Let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. Patience is God's path to perfecting us. Uh, I, I've read this and I, I've read this to you before, but I think about this often. And you've heard this story in a polycarp and you probably already know uh, the story, but amidst an angry mob, but the Roman proconsul took pity on such a gentle old man and urged Polycarp to proclaim Caesar is Lord. If only Polycarp would make this declaration and offer a small pinch of incense to Caesar's statue, he would escape torture and death. <clears throat> To this, Polycarp responded, Eighty and six years have I served Christ, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Steadfast in his stand for Christ, Polycarp refused to compromise his beliefs and thus was burned alive at the stake. I think about that. Eighty and six years have I served the Lord, and he's never... His testimony has never done me wrong. He was, facing, he was facing being burned at the stake. And he would not deny his Lord. He wouldn't offer a pinch of sacrifice to Caesar. God's been faithful to me. How am I going to go back and not be faithful to him? When we endure, I believe that, that, that brings that maturity in our life. God allows us to go through things to build that endurance in our life. We go through things. We, we come to this stage in our life and we look at a trial that we have and we look back and we say, God, you were good here and you were good there. And now I'm in a place where I've never been before, but I'm going to trust you now. And then God takes me to the next place and he's good there. And I can look back at what used to be the worst trial. And now I'm facing the worst trial, but he's been good every step of the way. And I believe he's going to be good all the way. Praise his name. He's bringing us to maturity. I, bring, I believe it'll bring uh, glory to God in our lives. In 1 Peter 4.12, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange, strange thing happened unto you. Paul says, when those strange things happen, don't think it's strange, but rejoice inasmuch that you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed... Huh? He's coming again, folks. 
He's coming in all of His glory when His glory shall be revealed. When He comes back from heaven, listen, all those that's mocked His name today, He's going to stand and every eye is going to see Him in all of His glory. When His glory shall be revealed, revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, He's evil spoken of, but on your part, He's glorified. Oh, listen, I won't want to walk through the trials of life and come out the other end still giving glory to God. I'm going to see Him one day. You're going to see him one day. I believe the closer we get to the end of time, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe we can expect more persecution as we go forward. Uh, folks, we're seeing it. We, we, we hear talking, uh, talk of it today. And uh, I read an article, I started to say a disturbing article. What too disturbing? Uh, but... Uh, some in our administration today, some of the some of the things that uh, the former ad administration put in to give us our religious liberties, if you will, this administration is going to try to take some of those things away. And, and and so, folks, just hang on, just hang on. The more we give thanks to God in our tribulation in our trying times the more glory of God will rest upon us what does that mean well I'm talking about our testimony we go through things and we praise God and we give him glory and the the outside world looks in and folks they're never going to understand that why do you do what you do? Why do you keep going to church? Why do you keep praising the Lord? You have difficult things. You have, where's your God now? You ever heard that? I've heard that a lot. Where's your God now? Well, he's still there. I had a doctor tell me that. If God's so good, why did he give you leukemia? Listen, folks, the head of the research department at Roswell Park Institute said that to me. If your God is so good, why did he give you leukemia? Well, so you could hear the gospel. You think about some of the people in the Bible. Thought about Stephen in Acts chapter six, and all the council that's uh, and all that set in the council looked steadfastly on him. They talk about Stephen. Uh, he was giving his testimony before the council at Jerusalem. And they looked on, uh, on Stephen and saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Listen, folks, they're about to put him to death. He's about to be stoned for his life. And as they looked at Stephen, they couldn't figure it out. It looked like he'd done seen an angel. He wasn't sitting there going, oh, 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 oh they're going to kill me. No. He was standing up and preaching and the Lord Jesus Christ. And they looked at him and now what's wrong with this guy? We're about to kill him, and he's acting like he's seeing an angel or something. I believe I know who he saw. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25, when um, the three Hebrew children were cast into fire, and Nebuchadnezzar looked in, he said, Lo, I see four men loose. I cast three in, but as I look in, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out of there. He looked in, saw four. Threw three in, looked in, saw four. Brought three out. The fourth one's still there, folks. He'll be there for you and for me when we go through the trial. Folks, I don't know if there's ever a time when God's more near to us than when we're giving Him thanks for what He's done. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, evil spoken of, but your part, he's glorified. Listen, folks, God wants to get glory from our life. And in, and in our thanks, in our, our, our giving of praise, he gets glory. And folks, that's what it's all about. God getting the glory. It's not about me getting glory. But it's about God 
getting the glory. I told you about a message I heard recently. And probably for 40 or 45 minutes, I listened to this preacher talk about what I've done and what I've done and I've done this and I've done that. And, and if this church was doing right, all these seats would be filled and this and I, 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 I never heard once what God done. Give you another. How does... How do we do that? Verse 20 again. Giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it, folks. Giving thanks unto the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We consider who He is. I thought about going to Revelation and, and reading some of the description of Him again, but you've heard that so many times. True thanks ought to be given to the Father through Jesus Christ. Oh, He's worthy, folks. We're going to spend all of eternity saying He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of our thanks. God is good. He daily loads us with His benefits. Now, folks, I... I don't say necessarily we have to give thanks for the bad things that come into our life. But we ought to give thanks for what God's doing in our life through the bad things. He's working all things together. All things work together for good. Not all things are good but all things work together for good. Even the bad. He's working it out for good in our life. Listen, folks. God overrules the bad. He takes all things and He works them together for our good. You know, that, 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 that's a tough verse sometimes. Oh, when, when you're on the good side of everything, it's easy to give to somebody else. But when you're on the bad side of things, that's about the last verse you want to hear. But it's still true. I think about unthankfulness and sin. It, uh, it, 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 it's the height of, uh, of, uh, of paganism. It's a mark of paganism, unthankfulness and sin. Unthankfulness is sin. Uh, in Romans 1.21, the Bible says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Where did a dark heart start? In an unthankful heart. You want your heart to become dark. Let it, be, let it cease to be thankful, and it's on its way to darkness. Giving thanks through the Son in the name literally means through the name of Jesus Christ. Give thanks through His name. Jesus is the one that makes it possible. Let's suppose if it wasn't for Jesus, what would we even be here for? We just might as well pack it up and go home. It's through Jesus that we give thanks. I don't think we're really giving thanks if we don't do it through Jesus' name. I thank, I thank God through Jesus Christ for each and every one of you. You're a blessing to me, and I thank God for you. He is the power of thankfulness. His name stands for the authority of of thankfulness. Listen, folks, through Jesus, we can give thanks. So, if you're saved today, you can say with 2 Corinthians 9 in verse 15, thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. How unspeakable is it that God would give Jesus to die for our wretched souls? It's an unspeakable gift. God gave the best that there was 
and that was his son. Do you know Jesus today? Do you know him personally? Is he your personal savior today? If you do, then you can truly give thanks. If you don't know him today, you can trust him by asking Jesus to come in your heart and save you. So, the most difficult command to obey is to be thankful always for all things. But folks, Jesus is the reason. And I believe because of that, we can attain gratefulness and thankfulness. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And again, folks, this morning, don't let anybody take, for, take our gratefulness away. Don't let anybody take your thanksgiving away from you. Jesus is still alive, and he's coming again, and we're going to see him. Our Heavenly Father, today, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you teach us about thanksgiving, about giving praise always for all things. Father, I contest, confess to you this morning that that's a somewhat difficult command to obey. But Father, would you help us to walk in the power and the fullness of your Spirit and through that, help us truly to be a thankful people. You've been so good to us. And Father, we look for the day when we are going to see you in all of your glory. But until then, help our testimony be that we're a thankful people. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.